My name is Dave Evans, and we're here making all things new. And specifically, I am the co-founder and an instructor at the D-Life Lab at Stanford University's design program, where we apply the innovation principles of design thinking to the wicked problem of designing your life at and after the university. You know, and because I teach design, the first thing we have to do is practice what we preach. And you know, design and innovation are not things you think, they're things you do. So we need more room. I need to get rid of this. I need more room, and so do you. Okay, here's what we're going to do. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to do the wave because you've been sitting and thinking for a long time. So your brain is completely disconnected from your body, and you don't even know what you're doing anymore. So here's the problem. We're going to start on this end of the room. When I say go, I'm going to give you a count to three. One, two, three, get go, as though that we're on the fourth count. No one's confused. Are we good? Okay. So here's how it works. I go one, two, three, go, and on go, you will stand up and say woo, and then that woo goes flying across the room this direction. Are we all clear? Good. One, two, three, go, woo. <laughs> Okay, that was practice. Okay, now, and basically I did this because I just want to see David Brooks go, woo, um, the, um, and now he's going to go, whoa, we're starting with David on the count of three, one, two, three, whoa, whoa. Okay, good. Now we're in much better shape. If we took an MRI of your brains, it's entirely different now. It's entirely different. Now, in addition to teaching at Stanford, I've been in high tech for 30 years and theoretically you know about this innovation stuff and I've been teaching on faith and work and caring about the sacred secular split eradication that Richard introduced us to this morning for about 40 years. So David Kim calls me and he says, well, you must be the expert. And I go, oh no, that's trouble. Um, and so you're the guy who can tell us about what Christian innovation is not just innovation, but distinctly Christian innovation, what it is and what it is not. So I'm going to give that a try. Well, before we go to Christian innovation, just what's innovation itself, okay, go online, dictionary.com. It is, you know, the introduction of new things or methods. Now you know, okay, that means not just thinking up something and conceiving it or even prototyping it, but introducing it into the world. That's, a, that's an innovation. Great. So God's job is making all things new. That's a big agenda God's working on, does it lots of different ways including through innovation with you by making and introducing new things. That's what we're looking at, Bill. Great, we knew that. Now where? Where do we do that? Okay, first and foremost, the innovation space. The innov all the new stuff. All the new stuff that's being introduced into the world and then the rather small subset, this is not to scale, of the stuff that worked. Okay, um, the stuff that actually works, most innovation does not. You know, as a matter of fact, if you want something in encouraging, I just read on the plane out here, it is, it must be considered that there is nothing more difficult to carry out, no more doubtful of success, than to initiate a new order of things. Machiavelli in The Prince. Um, so thoughtful people have been struggling with this for a while, so that, you know, the, the space of innovation that doesn't work, there's some heartbreak there, and then we got to look at the innovation that flourishes, that cares about the flourishing world, the agenda that Richard outlined for us this morning biblically. And then this subset of that, that is God-inspired. See, so the green space we're trying to operate in, above ground and below, um, is the space that's about human flourishing that God is inspiring. And just this diagram alone we could spend a long time chatting about because it brings up all kinds of issues. Like, what about all that spirit-inspired stuff that doesn't work? Does that mean God calls you to failure? What about the spirit-inspired stuff that's dancing on the ragged edge of the blue line that nourishes flourishing, and who's in charge of whether or not that was nourishing or not? Right? Robin gets to lay her head down at night comfortably knowing she's doing the right thing, but you're doing proof editing on the script for a soap opera. Are you inside the blue line or outside the blue line? Because it's not on the ground, you know. So, we, but we haven't got time to talk about that. They give me 15 minutes. So, what are you going to do? Well, at least try to figure out where do we start. Where do we start? And where we start? Well, this is innovation. Right? So, you need a great idea, and you need the initiative to take it somewhere. And if you have those two things, a great idea and initiative, you got something, right? Only problem is that's not where Christian innovation begins. You need those things but they're not where you start. Where you start is with a godly invitation. I can best explain that by telling you the formative conversation where I learned this idea. So once upon a time, that spirit-inspired stuff was something I was not very good at, and so, you know, I thought I was frankly really good at doing church. I'm pretty good at doing Christianity. 
I'm fair at doing God, and I suck at doing the Holy Spirit. Okay, the absolute truth be told. So I got to go get some help. So when in doubt, go to seminary, you know, hang out with people like Richard or what have you, and learn about this stuff. So I go to seminary for three years in the program in Christian spirituality at San Francisco Theological Seminary in order to learn how to pray and how to listen and how to discern and how to do spiritual direction and these contemplative practices. And there I meet my dear friend Gary Schmidt. Schmidt happens, he would say. Um, and... <clears throat> He does, all the time. Um, and, uh, but he's a Christian, it's okay. Um, and, um, <laughs> and Gary and I saddled up really close because he was the other Philistine capitalist in the group. Um, and, you know, because, because in my study group, in my study group, you know, I mean, we, we are pastors and counselors and art therapists and masseuse people and poets and artists, and then these two, you know, carnivores in the corner. And, <laughs> and so we, we hung out together for protection. And... Um, <laughs> And the second year, the thing is taught, it's an intensive in January on campus for three or four weeks, and then you go off and write papers and talk to your supervisors remotely for three years. And we came back the second year. You know, there's a big reunion, all the students talking to each other in the second January, 15 years ago. And we noticed something. Everybody's grumbling. Everybody's griping. And they all have the same complaint. They had run home to their home churches and home organizations and brought all this newfound competency in contemplative practice and ministry, and they really wanted to be transformative and bring the life of the Holy Spirit to the places that they were, and they had these great ideas and launched all this stuff, and they all failed miserably. And they were very unhappy. And Gary would go, huh? That's kind of sad. In fact, it's not only sad, it's aggravating because we're doing this contemplative stuff at a Protestant seminary steeped in the Reformed tradition where the distinctive is we do all of this in the context of congregational life. So we run over to the leadership and say, hey, you promised us a Reformed tradition, contemplative spirituality, and all these people are crashing and burning back at their organizations. You've done nothing to give us congregational tools. When do we get that stuff? And they go, yeah, that's a good question. We don't really have any of that stuff. You know, and we went, well, wait a minute. That's not okay. You're supposed to, you know, we came here to get that. They go, yeah, as a matter of fact, we knew you were going to come ask because we've been watching you guys, and uh, we have an idea. Why don't you do it? <laughs> we go, whoa, we came here. We bought the degree. We don't want to build the degree, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> excuse me. I'm paying for this thing, you know, and we're the lay guys. I mean, we're the Philistine lay guys, you know, we don't know what we're doing. And they said, well, yeah, it's true, you're all the Philistines, but, you know, you business guys, you, like, start stuff, and you know how to organize things and get people together, and you're much better at that than we are. Couldn't you just think it up for us, please? Okay, fine. So we say yes. So off we go, and we think this thing up, and we come up with an idea about doing church contemplatively. We get some great ideas. In fact, we really like our stuff. And then we go back halfway through the year and meet with Dr. Sister Mary Rose Bumpus. So Dr. Sister Mary Rose Bumpus, who is a fabulous woman, and of course you got to rent Catholics to teach this stuff, you know. Um, <laughs> yes, Trump Protestants don't know this stuff, you know, not, back then anyway. And, and she's fabulous, and we show her our stuff and how to launch things and how to put programs together and how to, how to you know, collaborate. And she's going, oh, huh, that's great, that's great. You know, I, I, it's, it's very, very nice. Um, I'm sure your colleagues will love this. We go, gosh, you look a little disappointed. She goes, well, yes. You don't like it, do you? Uh, no. <laughs> Why? What's wrong? Well, it's, it's, just, it's just all wrong. It, it's just all wrong. I can't tell you what it is. It's just all wrong. Well, that's not very helpful, Dr. Sister Mary Rose Buffett. I mean, look, we're doing the best we can here. Help us out. Cut us some slack. You know, we're just trying to help these people get initiated effectively. That's it, she says. You go, oh, well, I'm glad we're finally on the same page. She goes, no, 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 that's it. That's what's wrong. It's all about initiation. It's all about you. It's all inside out. It's all, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? How do I do it better? That's not how God works. God doesn't work by your initiation. God works by God's action in which we join. Or you say, oh, like we need an invitation. Yes, that's it. It's an invitation. You have to move this thing from initiation to invitation. You guys go back. You're smart guys. This isn't bad, but you've got to fix it. Go home, fix it. Come back, show me what you got. Let's take it from there. So we do. We go home. We fix it. We come back, and she's entirely right. We show it to her. She says, good, go with it. The next year, now we're two years into the grumbling, right, because we didn't get to teach it in the second intensive. We taught it in the third. So we had a whole day on doing church contemplatively, and everybody loves it. And here's the interesting part. Two years into the highly articulated complaint of failure, 
our colleagues, when they moved their point of view from how do I get this thing to work to what's God already doing, they could even then, despite the fact they were on the wrong track before, frankly, can now in retrospect see, oh, there it was. Because the challenge we're going for is to move from initiative to invitation, is to shift from permission to presence. Because if it's about you and your idea, all you need is theological permission. You know, write Richard an email, he will send it to you, get a coupon. Yes, this is theologically appropriate. Doctrinal things are easy to come with. That's that whole flourishing space. But where's the God-inspired subtext of it? <clears throat> to understand what the nature of that challenge is, we have to understand the problem of the spiritual person. Pointed out to me by my friend Eugene Peterson, who in 2005 in Christianity Today was interviewed in an article about the spirituality for all the wrong reasons. And he mentions this woman. We've all met a certain type of spiritual person. She's a wonderful woman, wonderful person. She loves the Lord. She prays. She reads the Bible all the time. But all she thinks about is herself. She is not a selfish person. But she's always at the center of everything she's doing. How can I witness better? How can I do this better? How can I take care of this person's problem better? And that's not it. But keep in mind, she is wonderful. She loves the Lord. She's praying all the time. She's studying her Bible. She cares deeply about other people. But she is initiating, initiating. What can I do? She's inside out, not outside in. It's disguising because of our language. It sounds so Christian. So the challenge here in moving from initiative to invitation is getting from permission to presence. Not just an idea that sounds good, but a recognition of the active, prevenient God who is always operating in the world and is inviting us to join with God. We are co-laborers, co-creators, but we are not first initiators. We might be able to look like the first thing. They're the, you know, Robin's team is the first group of people that have been transforming that trolley station, but where was God in it before? So where do we begin? Well, how about Scripture? Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the Father doing. Or as my mentor of 20 years says, Jesus, the least creative man who ever lived. <laughs> what do I do today? I don't know. I'm going to ask Dad. I don't know. I really, you know. Don't ask me. I'm not in charge. No. Um, and that's entirely accurate and, of course, totally unfair, which you understand that. It's paradigmatic. Um, but the point being, great, can you break that down for me, Dave? How about something implementable? I know it's only 15 minutes, but please give me something I can chew on. Um, okay, one, walk in the way expectedly. Two, listen for the longing. Three, cultivate the sacred imagination. Four, lean into the leading. I'll just barely touch these. By the way, at the 2 o'clock workshop, we'll fully unpack this stuff. We'll get back to all those nasty questions I skipped on the map, um, and we'll figure out how to actually do all four of these steps. Let me try to illustrate. Okay, could you actually show me this like a real person? Okay, how about the story about how I ended up teaching roomfuls of people like you um, at Stanford how to design their lives using design thinking? That was not obvious to me that was going to happen. Here's how it actually works, and we'll see if you see the four steps in it. So first thing is... <clears throat> I go online and I bump into Sin Boldly. I was teaching a Bible study and I referenced Luther's comment, Sin Boldly, and all the people in the study go, oh my God, Luther never said that. I said, yes, he did. You know, and they, these are like Wheaton grads. You know, these are actually you know, certified Christians. They've never heard this stuff. Um, I make MKs, I got PKs, you know, and I go, I'm gonna go, I'll prove it to you. I go on my Google Sin Boldly to find the context. It's in the letter to Melanchthon, by the way. And I find this book, Sin Boldly, by Dr. Dave, you know, from George Mason University about how to write the college essay. I think this is kind of intriguing. Find, I get into an email conversation with this guy talking about young adulthood. We're having a fabulous time. And I'm typing an email to Dave. We're dialoguing about how does one impact the young adult mind now. I'd been away from youth ministry for a while at that point in my life. This is now in the 90s, late 90s. Like, what's going on, Dave? You're current, you know? And I composed this email, and I hit the return key. And as I hit the return key, I thought, well, you know... That's different for him because he thinks about this all the time. And the email went off. But just as I had that thought, and, which happened when I hit the return key, I felt a breeze across my face. And I looked up and the window was closed. And I went, huh. And I went, uh-oh. And this is the expectancy. I could have just gone right on by, but then I went with some trepidation, is that you? 
really. And sure enough, then I burst into tears. And I had no idea why. I I do now. But I went, huh, apparently something's going on here. Um, So I had explored that, and apparently my heart was breaking for these people that I wanted to spend more time with like Dave got to. So what are you going to do about that? Well, you know, you've got to listen to that longing, and then you've got to see if you can't do something with it. So you're off, you go to have lots of cups of coffee and lots of beers with lots of people who do this thing all the time. And what's going on with you? And you meet this guy named Randy over at Cal, who runs a thing called Westminster House, and he says, you should come teach a course. They go, no problem, but I don't have a PhD, I'm not in the faculty, and I have no material, but other than that, we're good, you know? <laughs> and so, but that turns into, let's invent this thing called, you know, um, how to find your vocation is your calling, calling. it. teach it one time as an experiment, just to see if it works, and this kid walks up at the end of the last class and says, by the way, my friends want to take it in the winter. Are you teaching next semester? And I have one of those quarter-second prayer dialogues with God say, okay, here's the deal. You send the kids, I'll show up. Fourteen semesters later, I'm teaching this class, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe I ought to do this other places. What about going over to Stanford? And I end up having a lunch with this guy named Bill Burnett, because, you know, Stanford's totally hostile to people like me showing up. They actually do think, you don't have a PhD, you're not in faculty. Get the heck out of here, you know. You know, you're not as cool as we are. And so you got to sneak in, and the design group, which I knew pretty well, was now being run by this guy, an old friend of mine, and he had this conversation. We're one minute into the conversation about this thing I think is like a year of lunches. And, it's gonna, and he goes, I know exactly what you mean. We'll start in the fall, we'll prototype this summer, let's go. But you got to redesign it all through design thinking. Okay, no problem, we're good to go. So we invent this thing, and the years go by, and we teach it just to designers, and then the head of the career center says, can't you teach this to everybody? And Bill goes, no, and I go, sure. And, um, and now we teach everybody. About 15% of all undergraduates have now learned how to design their lives, and every single undergraduate has talked to somebody about how to do that. And we just launched the first GSB career design at the Graduate School of Business, and 400 first-year students learned how to do career design. But it's a long, difficult road. These four things are not easy to do. There's a lot underneath them. What does it really mean? Christian innovation is the spiritual discipline of a discerning imagination with the incarnational practice of real making. And don't forget, what it really is is a fabulous ride. I hope you take it. Thanks so much.